you know, when you think about forging steel, I mean, what, what that is by definition is altering the cross section of the material. So we're taking a, a bar or a sheet or whatever it is, and we're changing the cross section. So like if we started with, you know, a piece of three quarter round and we change that cross section, this is now, you know, five sixteenths round. So we've altered that cross section. So that's not a very dramatic altering where some of these are much more dramatic, but that's, that's what we're doing. So we're just taking the material that we have and we're moving it around to other places. You know, it's like Michelangelo said that, you know, all those sculptures were in the stone. He just had to get them out. So it, we're kind of like that. All the parts are in the steel. We just need to figure out where we need to move the steel and manipulate it to get that work out of it. So that's what this is about. So one of the first things we need to clear up is the word wrought iron. So you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's and uh, you can buy a wrought iron gate, uh, but it's not wrought iron and it's not the material is not wrought iron, and it's not wrought if you use that as a definition of hammering. There's nothing to do with wrought iron. So wrought iron is a specific type of material that has uh, iron and silica and very low carbon in it, and it's very stringy and fibrous, and so you can see this or send it around, whatever, but this is just a bar that I've split or cut most of the way and then broke, and you can look in here and you can see it's like wood grain. It's kind of it's stringy. So, and you can also tell the sound of iron, it, it kind of thuds, whereas steel is, it's a much different sound. It's the carbon in the steel that makes that ping and loud and what rusts, um, whereas the, there's almost no carbon in wrought iron. And so it's, it, it doesn't oxidize, it gets to a point, like I would scrounge iron out of the river in Memphis. So the, the metal museum is right on the Mississippi River and across from that is Arkansas and it's very rural. And there was a load of iron from an old bridge that, that uh, you know, they, they took down. So we would just go there at low tide and grab all these iron bars. Uh, but they would be, I remember finding a, like a two inch bolt uh, with a big nut on it and I heated it up and it just turned right off. You know, whereas the steel, it was totally rotten, you know, it was gone, it was just corroded. All the carbon was, was oxidized away. So, so rot can be the material, wrought iron. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, wormy chestnut. If you're a woodworker, it, it doesn't exist anymore. That, that, that wood is gone. So wrought iron is no longer manufactured and hasn't been manufactured for decades, a century really. Uh, so everything is steel now and we can go into a whole discussion about metallurgy that I, I'd be faking my way through most of it anyways. Uh, so anyway, so steel is, is steel. There are lots of alloys. So one of the ways that I like to approach the material is with some kind of texture. And the best way to work with texture is to just find it. You know, so we're lazy, sort of by nature, some of us, and it's just nice to just scrounge up some cool stuff. So this is sort of my, my most precious piece of steel that I've had for like 30 years, and I think this is perfect right here. I found it, I didn't do anything to this except cut it off of whatever longer piece it was on. I think the color, the texture, everything about this piece of steel is perfect. But you can't always find the perfect piece of steel. So sometimes you have to make your own textures and you can easily make this texture. If you found another piece, you would never use this. This is like, you know, the holy grail of this. So, but if you had a piece that looked like this and you cut off a section of it and you kept this cold and you heated up this plate of steel or sheet of steel and you smashed this onto it and moved it around, you're gonna impart the negative of this texture onto this piece of steel. Now, this is such a random texture that if we move it around like this, we're going to pretty much get that same texture as opposed to, you know, something like that, which is a very uh, rigid structure of this. So if we lay this down and we want exactly this shape and we smash this down, this is cold, this is hot, smash it down really hard and peel it off, we get the reverse of that. So that's not at all this. If we really wanted to make this, we'd have to do this into a thicker sheet to get that depth. And then we'd smash something else into this to now make this again. But this you could find real easily, so you really don't need to do that. But the other cool thing about this is that if you flip it around and heat this plate up and move it around like this, you're going to get this really nasty texture that I think is just gorgeous. And when you put a paint finish on that or wax uh, or, you know, colored anything and then scrape it off the high parts, it stays in the low parts and it's really cool looking. So this is like our jewelry version of a rolling mill. 
so a lot of this stuff that's out here is just sort of a progression of how, how these things might work. So this particular sample is taking this and just dung, 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 sorry, dung, 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 just moving it around and you get, you can create whatever pattern and texture you want with your pattern and texture. It's meta. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. Um, I say that and I probably will. No, I hope not. Um, but you know, so you can make textured plates. That's the cool thing about steel is that you can weld it. I mean, you could go right over there and turn on that welder and just, just snot weld some MIG wire onto a piece. And then you can use that and smash into this. So this was just welding little circular rings onto a plate of steel and then using that, heating this up and slamming it down. And you don't get the color that way, but you get the texture. And so the paint is that's another, that's another lecture. That's another demo. But anyway, so you could make all these different kinds of cool textured plates and then create your own plates. I taught at uh, Haystack, I've taught there several times, but one time I taught the high school workshop and there was a girl, a, you know, a high school girl in the class and she didn't want anything to do with fire, but she wanted to make some textured plates and stuff. So, so we found some thin sheet uh, and a block of wood and a punch that was very much like a center punch and just, while this was cold, just slammed this into something soft and created this kind of texture, which she ended up making cool things out of. So, you know, it was kind of that, like Stu was talking about tonight, or this morning, or this lunch, I guess, um, about, you know, it, it's not like if only. And I think, uh, to me, that really condenses this whole thought process a lot about working and, you know, being a, an artist or just a, a, a human in this society. It's like, man, if I only had, if only it was air conditioned in here, you know, God, it would be so much better. If, you know, if only I'd worn deodorant today. Um, you know, but then it's like, well, instead of like this, if only, he's like, well, what if you say, what if? Like, okay, well, what if this person doesn't want to use heat on this thing? How are we going to get texture? So you just have to think about it differently. And so that's how I've kind of approached this whole thing, and it took listening to Stu for like 20 years to finally figure that out. Um, but you know, that's what Stu does. He has that effect on us. Uh, so one of my favorite things to, to do has been to take this kind of thing. And I, I started squashing this perforated steel in 1994, which seems so, well, I mean, it is long ago. That was a long time ago. Uh, I started using it just as it was, and then I thought, well, if I compress those holes, what's going to happen? You know, and of course, when you heat this sheet up, it's, it's going to buckle all over the place. So it's a lot of boom, 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 flatten it back out, boom, boom, boom. And every time I do it, I think, this is so dumb. I hate doing this. <laughs> but then when I see the results, like this piece right here, this exact piece will yield that. And I just think that is the coolest thing. I love this texture. So that first box from the images today from 1994 or 5, uh, was made out of this exact stuff, same material. And I just think this texture is really beautiful. And if you try to figure out how that happens, even knowing how this happens, I'm still amazed, like that turns into that. Like, and then if you take this and stretch it out, it turns into this. So this thing turns into that thing. And uh, that's also beautiful. And this was a really interesting study on how, how your hammer works, how the force of some blow is translated into the material. So there are really a few things to know about forging and hitting metal or anything like that. So if you hit a piece of bar stock or sheet or plate or anything, and if you hit it with a light blow, so we'll just use a cube. Can you all see this if I draw right here? I'm terrible at drawing. Uh, even cubes I'm terrible at drawing. This is embarrassing. Um, <clears throat> so if I hit this thing with a little bit of force, what we're going to end up with, and I'm going to greatly exaggerate this, is this. Because that force comes down into the material a little bit, and that's all that it goes to. Right? So in, in raising, you know, in, in metal smithing, when you're raising a vessel, you thicken the edge up by basically doing this right here. So if I hit this with a lot of force, now I'm really going to lay into it, like the stuff Tom Joyce was doing with those massive blocks. What you're going to get is this, because the force comes in hits itself and pushes out. So you're going to get a different shape by this because the force comes out and in. So when I, when I hit this sheet, you know, this plate, and technically I think sheet is anything under like quarter inch. And after that it's all plate. So I think that's right. Uh, 
So when I hit this, I, that force is obviously not going all the way to the middle because there's so many things that are disrupting the force. Like if you drop marbles into here, it would take forever to go, you know. So, and when, it doesn't really look that apparent when you see it in this form, but when you see it in this form, you could really see like, man, this is almost solid on the edges and it's now open in the center. So yeah, that just shows that the force of the hammer blows didn't go all the way to the middle. Anyhow, I always thought that was kind of cool. Now, the other thing about this material is when you look at it, like if I look at it this way, this, all the stripes, the holes are lined up going across in this direction. If I look at it this way, they're staggered. So obviously going this way, it's going to squish a lot easier because there's not as much resistance as this way. You've got these solid bars that come down. So this is one of the rare cases where what's easier to do is actually nicer looking because I think this doesn't look that great. And that's when you squish it this way. And it's a pain, and I don't even like it as much. I think that looks way cooler. So it was, it was a nice uh, discovery that, like I said, what was actually easier to do turns out nicer. So then you start thinking, well, man, if it looks cool that way, what if I squish it always? So if I took a square of that and squashed both sides evenly, what is it going to do? And that gives you a totally different texture. Uh, and then if you dish it, it stretches out on one side, compresses on the other. So anyhow, these are just some of the cool things that I enjoy about this material. This is taking two of those thinner sheets of that and laying them on top of each other or staggered. And you get mostly a mess, but there's a couple of cool spots in here where everything just overlaps perfectly like a flower. And most of this stuff on the demo table was like this was going to be part of something and that something never worked, but this was kind of cool. So that's, you know, it goes into the demo table because you can't just throw this stuff out. Uh, let's see another, while we're talking about perf stuff. So this turns into this, uh, and then like the lid to that glass house over there is exactly this process, except a little bit thinner than this and smaller holes. You get to this point right here. I then slice this in half and then <clears throat> this side that's thick becomes the side that goes against the ridge line. So that the center of this gets, you know, it gets sliced in half and the center uh, or the outside edges, excuse me, go up here and then I taper this down. So what happens is you get that. So that's how the roof of this box is made, is by starting with that material and taking it to this form. <clears throat> so those are those. So the other cool thing about this uh, is this is more of the overlap, but I actually didn't weld it, didn't forge weld it like this. So, so under heat and pressure, so we had to cover some terms. So steel will stick to itself, will weld to itself under heat and pressure. So you bring this up to a welding temperature, which is, you know, like 20, uh, 2000 degrees, you could weld at, you know, kind of a yellowish color. You know, if you bring it up much hotter than that into 22, 2300, it starts sparking. Uh, well, 2,500, it's certainly sparking. And you don't really want to burn the material. You just want to get it hot enough so that it sticks to itself. So, uh, but if you do it out of stainless, stainless steel doesn't really like to stick to itself. So this was stainless. But I love the pattern that's created where these two overlapped and didn't stick together. And there's no reason why that couldn't be made out of thinner steel and actually stick it together. But I just, I love those little footballs that are in there, even though I don't like football much anymore. But I like that. <clears throat> so... Kind of flow, going with that uh, sticking steel together, forge welding steel together. This is just all thread rods. Uh, so, you know, just like long screws that don't have heads on them. Uh, just tack welded those down to a sheet and then threw them in the forge and smashed them. And, you know, this was always going to be the lid to a box that the box never got built. But this was cool. So this goes into the demo pile. And then you have the very complicated uh, Damascus or pattern welded steel, which is another whole class. So we'll just bypass that <clears throat> unless you're curious about it. So, <clears throat> so stamping. So you can find materials, like I said earlier, and make your stamps and squash things. Um, or you could be more in control of your universe and create your own stamps. So, uh, you know, and it's funny looking at this. This was from 1999 at Penland with Mark Majorana as my assistant. So we made this. Uh, stamp out of a jackhammer bit using 
this tool right here. So this is called a butchering tool or a butchering chisel. So, you know, sometimes chisels are flat like this. Sometimes they're a little rounded. This particular one, actually I'll exaggerate it so you can see it more clearly, goes like that where this, that would be 90. This is not 90. So what this is doing <clears throat> is it's, I mean, you can look right on here and see it's exactly this. Dun, dun. So you get one straight cut and the other is an angled cut. And that kind of gives you a relief area for the metal to, to flow. And so this stamp right here is the stamp that was used to make that. So that turned into this. So you heat this plate up, minus this, and you hit this with a sledgehammer and it squashes in there. So and that was kind of a cool thing to do, or you can make, you know, kind of a, you know, so, so blacksmithing, I said earlier in the, demo, or in the lecture today, so with forging, there are really only a few things you can do with a bar or a plate of steel. You can, you can draw a taper on it. We'll stick with bar stock. So you can draw a taper on it. You can flare out the end, spread the end out. You can upset it, you know, thicken it up into itself, you know, or you could like scroll it up, punch holes in it, but there really aren't a whole lot of things you can do with this bar of steel. But what you can do with those few techniques is, is pretty much unlimited. So this is five sixteen no, quarter inch square bar stock. And if you draw a long taper on this stuff and then flatten out one side. So if you, let's see, we draw our taper out and it's dead center. So when we look at it from the end, it looks like this. And then if we flip that up on the edge like that, and then squash these two sides right here, and roll that up, you're going to get this kind of thing, which is beautiful in its own right, like a fiddlehead fern. It's really cool. And then you could take this, and if you've got a guy that can swing a sledgehammer really hard, or you've got a big power hammer or a 100-ton press, you could put this under there hot and stick this under it with a ball right there or something that's going to squish a little bit, and, and it puts this really great negative space into this. Uh, and then if you make one that's round, you can do that. Uh, and then, you know, hang it on the wall. What else would you do? But I just, I love the idea of making these simple tools, uh, you know, that you maybe make two sort of slightly different shapes of them. And then that becomes, this one gets squished there, and that one gets squished there. Uh, and this doesn't look that nice, so this goes into the demo box, because this twisted and it's not very nice. But that's kind of cool. And if you really want to make these keep working, you make these out of tool steel. This is just low carbon steel, and I've had this thing for 20 years and made you know several of these. But it, it's time to make a new one of these. So, so maybe next demo we'll make one of those. So the other thing that I like to do quite a bit of is forging sheet and punching holes in sheet because I love like all the lids to these boxes kind of start out as this. So we'll make one of these uh, sometime in the near future. Um, where we'll, I have a piece prepped, we'll drill a hole in it, and then over a wooden block, we'll punch this out to make these. And the thing is, they don't, I usually punch them in straight, but they don't have to be straight. I really like this one at an angle. So this, again, was always going to be where some piece comes around here, like this. But I never got around to making that, but I really like this part of it. And it's good for the demo because they don't have to be straight. They can be curved at an angle. You just have to punch it at an angle. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, we could, we could come back to this stuff, but maybe we should just bang on something. So how many people here have actually seen forging happen? How many have tried it? So some people, so, but some of you, how many have never seen this before? Never seen a bar forged? Man, you have been missing out. All right, so. I've been to a bar. I have. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When I looked at Carbondale for grad school, the first place they took me was Trace Ombre's bar. And when I went to visit Cranbrook, the first place they took me was the library. And I still chose Cran a Carbondale, which was really dumb. <clears throat> so when you put your apron on, you know you're working. Or at least I know I'm working when I put on my apron. So uh, in my own studio, I have a coke forge. Um, I, I would much prefer coal, but when you burn coal, it puts out this big yellow plume of nastiness. And when you're in the city, people will call the fire department on you. 
And so I don't have that. But Coke, once you burn coal, it turns into Coke. So, uh, so I can burn Coke in there. Uh, but most of the time, I use a gas forge, which I don't really like, but it works. Uh, and I use a torch. So for, for today, I'm just going to use a torch because most of you guys probably, if you want to try this, don't have access to a forge, but you probably can easier get access to a torch. So uh, we'll have that. So I thought we would just start by, uh, well, we should start by doing some stretching because that's really important. So when you, I don't hammer every day. Uh, I might go months without forging anything. But what you should do, even as a maker, you should stretch a lot because it's important to do all that stuff. Um, and you should do it slower than this, but we're in a hurry. And the other thing that I like to do, I keep these in my truck. You know, these are off broccoli or whatever vegetables your choices are. So we're grabbing things constantly, but we don't do this very often. So you get one of these big rubber bands, and especially when I'm in traffic, which thankfully in Cleveland doesn't happen that terribly often, but this is sort of my stress reliever. I'll do like 25, 30 with each hand. But these are good because then you start working these muscles instead of these muscles. So as metalsmiths, as you get older, you need to do these things. And as makers, ceramic artists, whatever, you need to do that. Uh, bars. So this is pretty short, but uh, oh my god, right here. three legs. Okay, I think that's far enough away from you guys. So um, hammers. There are a lot of different kinds of hammers. I brought two kinds with me. I mean, two kinds of different forging hammers. So. There are Swedish pattern hammers, there are German pattern hammers, there are, what did I say? German pattern, Swedish, and French. I like these French ones. They have a great balance to them. Uh, the Swedish ones are, have a longer cross peen, and the balance is terrible. Um, but that's what I learned on. But these, these guys are the, they're the best. And they come in gram weights. <clears throat> this one is 1,200 grams. This one is a thousand. Anyhow, so some of the other hammers that I use are these more rounding hammers. So um, yeah, so most of these, the faces are slightly crowned just a little bit. They're not dead flat because when I swing a hammer, I'm never going to hit perfectly flat. Oh my god, that's going to be loud. We'll stay off here. So nice. Uh, so yeah, so you want to have the edges slightly rounded because if I swing, particularly right-handed, my tendency would be to hit a little bit of an angle like this. And if that's a razor sharp edge, you're going to dig the crap out of your metal and you don't want to do that. So we'll talk more about this rounding one later. Another hammer that I use a lot are these. So when I make all this cool texture, I don't want to smash it with a steel hammer and smash all that great texture that I worked so hard to put in there. So I use these. This is a rawhide, which smells terrible when you hit hot stuff with it but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't ding up your surface. And if you use a straight rawhide mallet, they don't weigh anything. So this is cast iron. Uh, these things are expensive new, but they're almost always at a flea market in some place for cheap. And uh, I found that for some of these, it's cheaper to, instead of buying the inserts, I just buy a rawhide mallet and cut it in half because the rawhide mallet is actually cheaper than these inserts. And this is a little one. They make these in much bigger sizes, but I didn't want to carry that, so I brought this one. And then this is probably the hammer I use the most, uh, an auto body hammer that I paid a dollar for at a flea market. If you go online now, these are like 60 bucks. This thing is so cool, it's my chasing hammer. Uh, I got tired of hitting my knuckles with stuff, and so I use this now. I don't even have to look most of the time. Okay, and then this magical hammer, this was in a bucket in a blacksmithing conference in 1992. There was a whole bucket of these, and I bought a pile of them because I was going to polish up the faces and make these really gorgeous uh, uh, planishing hammers, except the texture on here is exactly the texture of that plate, or it used to be before I banged on it for 20 years. So I love this guy. All right, so for this, we'll use this guy because it's not too heavy. All right. So when I heat this up, this is stupid short, but I can, get a, I can get a heat out of here so we can at least draw a taper without burning my hands. So steel is a horrible conductor of heat, unlike like copper or bronze or gold or silver or aluminum. So when I heat this up, I'll have this end at like 2200 degrees and I'll still be able to hold it here for a little while. And so will any of you. I don't have superpowers that I don't burn. Um, 
but uh, this is, I won't get much out of this before this gets too hot. So when it does get too hot, we have tongs. And these are not ones that I've made. I've made lots of different ones, but these are not. They're from off-center forging. They're super light and really nice. But they grip the metal exactly right. Like, it's not coming out. And that's really important because I know so many blacksmiths that have burns, burns, other people, when you hold something that doesn't fit very well and it goes flying around the shop at 2,000 degrees, that's a bad thing. So you want the tongs to fit what you're doing. So when I do demos and things for this small stuff, these are the tongs I always use. And then for sheet work, this is these guys. These are farrier's tongs. They hold horseshoes, but they also hold sheet and plate really well. And they do that really well because the center is hollowed out. So it's grabbing around the edge of the material. If it was dead flat, it would wiggle around and it wouldn't stay tight in there. These are great, and I have these ranging from eighth inch up to like half inch, you know, this gap where they close parallel to each other. These are fantastic tongs. Okay, so <clears throat> I already turned those on. This is the tiniest rosebud I think I've ever seen, but I think it will get us hot enough for what we need. Will you just put that somewhere other than here? Thanks. So we could heat up. This is a forge, but this is a monster. It's called Johnson Gas Forge. And this would make this room about 40 degrees hotter, and it's so loud. And to heat this up, I, I don't need that thing. So I'm not going to use this. But in my own studio, sometimes I'll heat up on the fire bricks. But I think here we'll just use this cutting table. So pardon my back. <laughs> So I like to pretend I'm a glass blower sometimes because they make all the money. Okay, so that's close to 2000 degrees and I'm just going to rotate at 90 degrees and strike. So you can do two on one side, you can do one on one side. So you can see it's changing colors. That means it's getting colder. Okay, so we have now taken this bar, and for those of you who've done this, I'm sorry, I just figured if you've never seen this, this is where you start. So we took this 5 16th round bar and we drew it out into a square point and so hopefully if I did it well which is sort of okay that points in the dead center of this and that didn't really take a whole lot of effort yet and it's still not too hot I can still hold this right here even though this right now is still about 900 degrees it's just not moving the heat down so yeah so we just made a point okay so that is Absolutely, the very basic thing about forging is just drawing a paper. So to, to illustrate that point, so I want to make a really short paper on here. So I'm lifting this up. This anvil has several. I'm going to angle this down just a little bit. All right, so now I've just put a shoulder on here. And you can see that I didn't touch that point at all. So the hammer blows are like this. So I'm not touching that point at all. Okay? 
So this is the start to what that leaf might be on the end of this thing. It's going to be a little crooked because I wasn't paying attention. But we can straighten it out. We'll see. Okay, so from here, we're going to flatten it just a bit. That's so loud. And then we're going to go this way. Okay, so here. <laughs> nice. So here you can see all the hammer marks. And they're all just straight. And they're still, you can still see where that point is where we didn't hit the point at all yet. So what we've done was we, we isolated the mass and we spread it out using the cross peen side of the hammer. Okay? Still see the point? I haven't touched that, otherwise that would swish out. I want to keep a nice point on there. So Kevlar gloves. You can't pick up screaming hot red, you know, orange hot things, but these really keep the heat out. Okay, so, so we start with that. And that's kind of cool. Absolutely. I mean, everything I make is, I said this morning that in the last snag conference, somebody who gave a presentation said she's forever a jeweler who doesn't make jewelry. And I think that certainly applies to what I do. Uh, whatever I make, whether it's, you know, like I don't make very many wedding bands, but I've made a few. Um, any of this stuff, I approach it as a jeweler, really, with that mentality. I want every surface to be considered. I want every you know, every aspect of this stuff to be <clears throat> worked over the way a piece of jewelry would. I mean, this is a box, uh, but I mean, this is tiny forging. This, this may as well be a, a brooch, yeah. you know, um, this, <laughs> thanks Bill. Uh, you know, so this is all, this is chisel work. So like the roof of this box right here starts out as, 
not exactly this, but something that's like this, this pipe fitting. So I would slice this open, flatten it out, so it looks sort of like this. And then I would chisel across these threads, which we can do. I can just show you how that works. I brought some. And then I flatten that out. But this is so much about this jewelry surface and finish and fit. I mean, you know, these lids fit one way. It doesn't fit that way, this way. It fits that way, only that way. So it's very precise. And the furniture, the sculpture, if it's, you know, seven foot long sculpture, every surface is considered the way this box or a ring would be considered. I, I approach it the same way. Uh, it's, I don't want to sometimes. I mean, I wish I could just loosen up, but I can't. It's like, I think it's like if you know how to do plumbing, you're kind of obligated to, to like do your own plumbing work in your house, you know? So like, I know how to do this. And so it's like, oh man, like some days I go to the studio, like when I was working on some of the sculptures and all day in the studio, all I did was drill eight holes. I'm like, this is stupid. I mean, I can't spend all day making eight holes, but those eight holes were through crazy stuff that had to be perfectly aligned and jigged and milled out and all this stuff so that if I did that step, it would make 10 steps down the road, it would work. Like these legs, those trestle legs for the sculptures, if they weren't all jigged up, machined at the right angle, one degree off over three feet is a lot. I mean, that, those legs would have been all over the place. And so, yeah, so that day I made eight holes in some steel. And I was like, this is this is stupid, but I like the end result. It's like in school, I ran 400 meters and I hated it until I saw the end of the race. And I was like, oh, that wasn't so bad, you know, but it was torture. I hated it, you know, so I hate making my own work sometimes. It's just, it's just, this is not a fun process sometimes, but sometimes it's really great. And that's why we do it. I don't even call myself a blacksmith. I work with metal. I'm a metalsmith who works with steel. I, I know the forging language, but you know, I mean, a blacksmith is somebody who does this every day. I don't, I don't do this every day. Uh, I, I combine wood and glass and steel and I make sculpture and furniture and whatever, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm more interested in other things too, but everything seems to be based out of this language of forging and moving the material. I just, I love the way this stuff works. I, I mean, I've been forging steel, banging on steel for 25 years and I'm not bored with that process. I mean, Sometimes I, I get bored with just, you know, being an artist or whatever, and I'll go ride my bike or go take photographs instead. And as I've gotten older, too, I, I've really found the importance of hobbies. I mean, when I was younger, I didn't have any hobbies. I mean, I had hobbies when I was a kid, and then in college, you all, you know, drinking and running and, do, or, you know, whatever. But then when I got, like, seriously into the profession, I really didn't do much except work. I lived at the Metal Museum. I worked at the Metal Museum. All I wanted to do was learn and forge and just suck this up as much as I could. And it was great. And I loved it. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. But, you know, like, when I turned 50, I'm like, man, I just, like, there's other stuff I'm interested in. I love steel. And I don't ever want to stop learning about it. And there's so much to learn. I mean, I feel like... I'm just scratching the surface, man. There's so much to know about metal and steel in general, I mean, metal in general and steel in specific. But, you know, I also have really enjoyed the camaraderie of riding bikes with this group of guys and, you know, meeting people that are interested in raptors and photographs. And it's been really fun. I think it enriches the rest of my, of my life and certainly my studio practice. Yeah, it keeps me out of the studio, but I think it's important to have a balance of doing other stuff. And just physically, it's been really important to, you know, this is, this is hard. What we, you know, jewelry is hard. Ceramics, it's hard. I mean, it's hard on your body. You're crunched over. It's terrible, you know? So you got to like go the other way and move. And, you know, one I can say core strength has been super important. So strengthen your core as you get older, man, that is, it all comes from right here. That's important. Um, yeah. So we have like 10 more minutes. Do you, is there, I, I feel like we haven't really seen all the demo stuff. Are there things on there you guys were curious about? And like, hey man, how did you do this? Or you know, uh, or you just, you, you soaked that all in and you're gonna go back and make all those things now. So upsetting uh, is just taking metal and smashing it in this way. Um, there are a couple of uh, examples of upset stuff here. The lid to this box, uh, this was round tubing that was upset a lot so that when I squared it, I could still have at least straight sides, if not a flared side. So that was upset tubing. <clears throat> that is not upset. Yeah, uh, there's some pipe. Oh, this stuff this is what I'm looking for. So these guys are upset. So 
This is a piece of tubing. This has been upset. We'll make one of these here in a second. And then this is also upset. It's more in the center of the bar. And I know uh, Matthew and I were talking about Fred Fenster's work in jewelry and pewter where he would scribe lines on the insides of things to weaken the material so that when he squished it, it, would, it was weaker where the material was gone and he would get these beautiful sharp lines that were, this is not upsetting, but he would get sharp lines like this uh, by weakening metal. So what this is, is torch heating a very specific spot and then squashing it and where it's hot, it's the weakest and it's gonna move there. So we'll do something like that. Now, um, bar stock, upsetting is kind of like this. If we, can you see that at all at this angle? So if I just take this bar and I hammer it this way, I'm going to get more of this kind of upset. But if I take this, and this is kind of counterintuitive, if I do more like that and upset it, now that this kind of thing happening here is happening here, so we're going to get a deeper We're going to get a deeper upset because we don't have as much metal out here on the fringes to spread out. <clears throat> so before I actually upset this, I'm going to hammer this edge. I could take it to the grinder and grind it off, but that's annoying. Um, and plus, it's way faster. Uh, <laughs> 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 on round stock, it is faster. Square stock, it's probably not. Anyway, we're going to hammer this a little bit before we do the upset. And upsetting, I want a short heat uh, or as long of an upset as I want. So we'll heat this up, we'll put a bevel on it, and then we'll heat it up again and smash it. And then we'll do the same thing on a piece of tubing. Uh, so we're using a torch. This is a rosebud. And you guys know probably, if you're metals people, that the hottest part of that flame is right where those cones end. This might take just a few minutes, or a minute. Okay, so always know where your tools are. That's really important. Okay, so we just put a bevel on there uh, just so we could do what was in the drawing. And so now we'll heat this up and we're going to upset it by just doing that. And I'm going to rotate it as I slam it down because I know I'm not going to go straight down. So as I rotate, if I'm crooked, it'll get crooked all the way around it. <clears throat> So that's nice and hot. So. So that's kind of early stages of it. You can see going out kind of nice. Didn't take a whole lot of effort. 
So we could keep going on that. There's enough heat there to. And that's pretty much too cold, but you get the idea. All right, so we'll take one more heat and we'll upset this again. Now one thing we can also do is just quench the very end of that so we don't get so much of that kind of mushrooming on the very end. So that's not too bad. It's And then we can make it a little prettier by beveling that back just a bit. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's not a bad looking upset. We'll start over here this time. So that's pretty decent. I've kind of chewed it up on the edge of the anvil, which I would probably want to do that faceting on the edge over the horn so I don't get those dig marks in. This is a demo. You guys see it okay? Yes? All right. So, so that's kind of bar stock. And you can keep going on this, you know, just keep repeating the process until you get that where you want it. We could spread this thing way the hell out if we really wanted to spend the time. Um, or we could take a bigger bar and draw a taper down, but you know, it's a lot easier to start with this and make this fatter than it is to take a big one and make it smaller because I don't have a big enough hammer to hit big stuff. So that's that. <clears throat> um, tubing is a very similar way of working. <clears throat> The thing about tubing, obviously, is it's hollow and that heat's going to go blasting through the bar or out through the tube, so it gets a lot hotter. When you quench tubing, you definitely want to do that away from people. <clears throat> All right, let's get that hot again, but you can see what's going on there. That's starting to really get a nice bubble in it. And I quenched the end of it out because I didn't want that to peel out all over the place. Okay. So if I knew I was going to upset this tubing, I would have left it longer so that I could do this easier. And we'll do that on the next one. So we'll take one more heat on this. <clears throat> Uh, honestly, this is this is it's easier. It goes faster. Uh, most of the vices don't hold that tight, and I'd put it in the vise horizontally, typically, so you get more surface area biting on it. Yeah, this this actually is easier with a long bar. Sometimes I put a plate on the floor and you know on a long bar and slam it that way. Make 
making sure that's not pointing at anybody. So we'll try slamming it this time. I don't know if there's enough mass there really. kind of nice. Okay. So nice little bulbous shape on the end there. Okay. So, so we're kind of done. Uh, <laughs> that's a much bigger bulbous shape. So over the winter, I, uh, I gave myself January to just play in the studio and make stuff, shapes that I thought we'd turn into sculptures, and I think they will eventually. I think this still is not going to, it's not destined for the demo pile quite yet. It's going to turn into something, but this started out as this. I mean, this is, there's a weld right, right here where I welded this. Once it got neck down, I welded it to this pipe so I have something to hold on to, but this bulbous shape started as that. Uh, what else? Is there anything else on here you guys want to see, hear about? We're, we're kind of out of time. This one? So, like I said earlier, uh, steel under heat and pressure will stick to itself. And so, if you took a similar piece to this, this is just woven wire, so it's, you know, three-quarter inch centers, whatever. But it, the closest thing I brought was this. So, this smashed into here and taken away imparts this texture into here. But if you take that and forge weld it down, so fuse it down to it, it you get that. And that's what this was, a different texture of course, but basically making a flat sheet like this. And then I rolled it up into a cylinder and there's a joint right here. And I didn't want to, actually it wasn't so when you do this kind of thing, it's real easy to burn those little edges off. And I'm sure, I made this in grad school, so this would have been 1998 probably, so 20 years ago. And I'm sure I burned the ends off a little bit, because when I rolled it up, I remember there was a, a gap in here. And so I used chisels and pushed, if you look on here, you can see all the chisel marks, just like you saw in that leaf shape where you'd see all the cross peen marks, where that's pushed in to close the joint. And then up here, I chiseled over. So this is what sculptors call chasing, which is, this is chasing, but you know, like ch sculptors call it grinding. I'm chasing this bronze. Wait, no, you're not. You're grinding it, bronze. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so yeah, so this, this seam was chiseled closed to close it up. And this was going to be this really cool piece on this other box vessel thing that, that uh, it was awful. But this is kind of cool, so I kept this. All right, what else? What else is in here? So tapering can be done on tubing as well as on bar stock like we did, and it doesn't have to always be in the middle. So this is a one-sided, you know, whatever, one flat taper onto tubing. And the cool thing about leaving that ridge right up there is that when you bend this, so when you bend tubing, it's gonna oval out on you. So if we had a round piece like this and we bent it this way, it's gonna collapse. So if you pre-oval it this way so that when you bend it, it stays round. But in this case, I put this ridge line on it so that when I bent it, this, this was a nice curve and this kind of went and I, I really like that. So the, one of the oil cans from way back when, this was a demo spout for it. All right, I could do this all day, man. Um, so it's kind of up to you guys. We're over time. Our next thing starts at four, I think. Yeah. So thank you for coming. If there's sample stuff, I'm going to throw it in a box. But if you have other questions, I can hang out for a little bit. And tonight we can chat. Uh, and tomorrow there'll be time as well. So now that you see the samples and you know how some of this is done, I'm here. Pick my brain and we can have a chat. All right. Thanks. Thank you.